this is Janet Diane Morris Wordlow for Expansions.com and as you can see we are still missing Stuart. He is still in Africa and won't be home for another couple of Sundays so that's the day we film. So with that said let's just get right into the news. I don't have a whole lot today but I have the, some stories that are very interesting. So of course this is our first week of April 2017 and time is flying as it always does. Unless you're on my blog, where I talk about how time is elastic, but that's another story. Anyway, starting with my top story, which is about former Vice President Dick Cheney saying that Russia's efforts to sway the recent U.S. presidential election could be viewed by some as, quote, an act of war. And as I always tell you, this is all a show put on by the global handlers for you. So... He goes on and he makes these comments during a part of his speech at the Economic Times Global Business Summit where he talked about Russian President Vladimir Putin's, quote, cyber warfare, cyber attacks on the U.S., unquote. Then he goes on, quote, there's no question there was a very serious effort made by Mr. Putin and his government, his organization, to interfere in major ways with our basic foundational democratic processes. In some quarters, that would be considered an act of war, unquote. Well, as I always tell you, this is all a show. And, of course, Russia has been very close to President Trump. But it is still a show for you because they're not going to tell you what's really going on. And then, moving right along, former CIA Director, CIA Director James Woolsey says Americans are, quote, looking largely at the wrong issue, unquote when it comes to allegations of collusion between House Intelligence Committee Chairman David or Devin Nunes, Nunes and the White House. During an interview with CNN, Woolsey said that the idea, quote, is politically interesting, but it's nowhere near the problem that the Russians could cause in our next election by doing their planned hacking and putting mal malware into our voting machines and so forth over the course of the next period of time before the next election. And, of course, he's making it sound like your vote actually counts. But, as we already know, your vote doesn't count. And, of course, we have the Electoral College, which I'm even not so sure that their vote counts. So, it's all the show. We already know who's going to be in advance long before any election happens. But they're putting this idea in your head that Russia is dangerous and can interfere in the U.S. And, therefore, they're developing some sort of anti-Russian feeling within the populace of the United States. And then um, Woolsey continues, quote, There's a real danger here because approximately 25% of our voting machines in the U.S. do not have paper backups. So if the electronics have been tampered with, you will never know and you can't do a recount. We've got to get that fixed. The rest of this is, a, is very minor by comparison. So, as I'm telling you, it's all a show anyway. Your vote doesn't count. They're trying to make you hate Russia. They're starting to get this feeling inside of you that something is wrong, and they're going to build on that. So with that said, this was interesting news that was sent to us by one of our people in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. It's, and it says, people born in the territory of the Soviet Union or the descendants of the USSR and the Russian Empire. Now, I thought that usage Oh, that phrase was interesting, Russian Empire citizens can expect to receive a Russian passport. The Russian State Duma is considering a bill that would simplify the procedure for obtaining Russian citizenship. To have a Russian passport, it will be enough to confirm the fact of birth in the territory of the USSR or the connection with ancestors born in the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. So I thought that was interesting, and of course it will be interesting to hear Stuart's take on that, because obviously he has ancestors there, since his great-uncle great was the first president of the Soviet Union. So we'll see what happens. Maybe Stuart's going to get a Russian passport soon. Who knows? And then moving right along, I keep bringing up the idea to you that Nazism continues to be put forth in the news. Well, you might have read this story about Turkish President Erdogan, recent statements in which he accused German Chancellor Angela Merkel of using Nazi methods and therefore provoked angry reactions from the leader of Germany's largest Jewish organization. Erdogan has repeatedly accused some European countries, and Germany in particular, of fascist or Nazi-like policies. 
In his most recent remarks, the Turkish president personally accused Merkel of taking Nazi measures against, quote, his Turkish brother citizens in Germany and brother ministers. Erdogan's statements quickly provoked a wave of outrage from Berlin, and then the Turkish government justified its Nazi remarks by saying that it is concerned over a perceived rise of fascism in Europe, adding that the comparisons were actually intended to be a friendly warning. Quote, we make these metaphors about fascism and Nazism because we worry about the future of our European friends. We do know what these comments mean, particularly in Germany. And then he stressed that Europe is Turkey's, quote, close ally, friend, and neighbor, which could face a very bad future and emphasize that measures should be taken to avoid it. And because of all these Nazi remarks, I found an article well, a week or two ago, which was really interesting to me, comparing Trump to Hitler. So just out of curiosity, I put that into my Google search engine, and it came up with over 500,000 results. So there's a lot of Nazism that's going out there. Like I've told you, that's not dying, and it's not going away. And then, in London, there was a mysterious breast that appeared... Um, in London, and the quote, title said people can't stop staring at it, and of course they called it a B-O-O-B, which I don't believe in calling women's breasts that, because that is not a very positive statement of a female's body. Anyway, this particular article says, because society has sexualized the anatomy of a female body, Women can rarely feed their children in public without receiving shrewd glances and in turn feeling judged. To combat the fact that public breastfeeding remains to be a taboo act in many modern first world nations, activists with the British independent creative agency called Mother London recently installed a giant inflatable breast on the city's skyline. And this appeared on UK Mother's Day, March 26, and it's part of Free the Feed campaign that promotes a non-judgmental approach to feeding. Now, what's interesting to me is that I had two sons. I breastfed them in public. I never had any problems. And to me, again, this is a made-up issue. I don't exactly understand why yet, but it's never been an issue as far as I'm concerned, and I don't know anybody who has had this issue other than what it's made up in the news. So again, they're putting on a show for you. And then moving right along, uh, you might have heard the story of Rachel Dolezal, who was the head of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP, or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Rachel Dolezal was a white woman who now identifies as a black person. And she said that people should be able to choose the race that they want. In fact, she's calling herself a trans black person. She was raised in a strict fundamentalist Christian family where she says she always felt black and would imagine that she was an adopted Egyptian princess. She later reinvented her race and backstory. She added extensions to her hair and she darkened her skin to appear black. Now this reminds me of when there used to be more prejudice against black people and black people who were lighter skinned tried to what they would call pass for white. But now we have white people trying to pass for black. Rachel goes on to say that she's drawing parallels between transgender and her racial identity, saying, quote, that is somewhat useful. Just because gender is understood, we've progressed, we've evolved to understand gender is not binary. It is not even biological. I don't know what school she went to, unquote. Anyway, now she has a book out. It's called In Full Color, and it's her memoir. And she talks about her racial fluidity and her sexuality is also fluid, apparently. And again, like I've been telling you, this is a show. It's a way to imprint you. And what I have thought for a long time is they only want one race because that makes it easier to control with the bind patterns. Now, you just don't just get this kind of publicity unless the global handlers want these kind of stories out there. And on top of that, when she's talking not only about trans black and gender is not even biological, and not binary. So, okay, again, this is, here we are, binary, and I talked to you before about in California, on your driver's license now, you can choose that you are non-binary, I think is the term, besides male and female. So, what is non-binary and what is binary? So, I went and, put, again, put this in my Google search engine, and I got more confused than ever. Binary slash non-binary. 
And then it goes on to say, have an androgynous, both masculine and feminine gender identity, such as androgyny, I guess an E instead of a Y. Have an identity between male and female, such as intergender. Have a neutral or unrecognized gender identity, such as agender, neutral, I guess, or most exenogenders. Have multiple gender identities, such as bigender or pangender. Then it goes on to say the gender binary, also referred to gender binarism, sometimes shortened to just binarism. And that's the classification of sex and gender into two distinct opposite and disconnected forms of masculine and feminine. So it's like, okay, no matter what I read, I was more confused than when I started. So with keeping that in mind, because to me, I think what it's going to head toward is if you're binary, then that means you're a, a robot, and if you're non-binary, then you're uh, then you're biological, I guess. Maybe that's the way they're going to to make it all come out. I don't know. But I kept doing my research, and in the middle of my research, someone sent me a an email that they got from a prestigious scientific conference. I'm not going to tell you the topic uh, for to protect this person's privacy. However, this person's email said, and again, this is a, was a very prestigious um, university function, a research group in the scientific community, said that please join us by adding pronoun stickers to your name badges. This will be a handy way of properly addressing your colleagues. From now through the end of the meeting, stickers with the following pronoun sets will be available at the registration desk. He, him, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs, Z, Zem, Zers, Z, Here, Here's, and blank, in case you want to fill in your own, I guess. And so if you're a remote attendant, then they tell you which key to strike so that people will know which pronouns to use. And then, in the absence of a pronoun marker, they are encouraging the participants to use they, them, and theirs. So, it says, in presenting pronouns alongside of names, we hope to make it easy to know which pronouns to use for someone you've just met. Make it easy for people who use pronouns outside the gender binary and are recently changed the pronouns to let you know. Foster a welcoming environment inclusive of everyone across the gender spectrum. Encourage conversations about an understanding of the gender spectrum outside the binary. See, and binary, gender binary, non-binary, to me that's all the basics of, of all of this, but I don't even understand what that is. And then it goes on to say, and this is the same email to this uh, collection of scientists, gender is not binary across the distribution of humans, and many of our colleagues at the meeting will fall across the broad spectrum. For anyone interested in learning more about the gender spectrum and diversity of pronoun usage, we recommend the following introductory resources, which I have uh, listed at the end of this article, the podcast, you'll, you'll see it. Please join us in presenting your pronouns so we can avoid instances of misgendering amongst colleagues and friends and create a truly inclusive and equitable work environment for the world-class researchers of the blah 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 collaborations. And so I clicked on a couple of these just to see what they had to say. So first of all, rule number one is don't assume you know someone's gender just by looking at them. And then it goes on to say while well, younger generations and progressive companies like Facebook are more likely to embrace the fact that gender is not dichotomous, older generations, which would be me and Stuart, and slow-changing institutions such as K-12 through schools and prisons, why they mention that I don't know, still have catching up to do. For those who don't identify with a gender, gender marker assigned to them at birth and don't want to be pinned down by binary labels, the moves by Harvard University and University of Vermont are a good first step. So, Caltech Center for Diversity, Gender Pronouns, a guide for faculty, staff, and allies. This is, again, one place that people can learn about these things. So, apparently, a gender pronoun says that we've moved away from the language of preferred pronouns due to people generally not having a pronoun preference, but simply using pronouns. So, now using preferred pronouns can accidentally insinuate that using the correct pronouns for someone is optional. So it's, it's so confusing. What kinds of pronouns can be used? These are not the only pronouns, but they give you a list because they say new ones emerge in our language. So remember, now they're telling you language evolves, so I guess so does your gender. And some people prefer not to use pronouns at all and would like their names to be used. So we have they, Spivak, Z, Z in here, Z and, and Yo. So Yo left, I called Yon, Yoss is here, that is Josh. 
Yo likes Yosef. <laughs> Sorry, that's too much. But you can see there's a whole chart here just in case you want to use some of these. And this again, this is Caltech Center for Diversity, Gender Pronouns, A Guide for Faculty, Staff, and Allies, I guess. Why is it important to respect pronouns? It says, when someone is referred to by the wrong pronoun, it can make the person feel disrespected and alienated. And I'm sorry, disrespected did not used to be a verb, but now it is, so I don't like that one either. Inquiring about pronouns is a simple way to show you want to cultivate an environment that respects all gender identities. It may feel offensive to ask for pronouns, but because society has taught us that identifying outside of the binary is abnormal, and you don't want to suggest someone is abnormal, but the truth is it is not offensive, it's incredibly necessary in a way to be inclusive. So, are you confused yet? I'm confused. How should I ask someone's pronoun? Well, you can ask them in private. You can do a group exercise, it says. It says, everyone tell your name and a fun fact and your pronouns. And for example, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. So what's your, or yours? Or when you take attendance or a roll call, you can have students respond with their preferred name and pronouns. And if you make a mistake, it's okay to apologize, correct it, and move on. And then it says, if you forget their pronoun or they've changed their pronoun, it's still okay to apologize, correct it, and move on. And if other students or faculty are using the wrong pronoun, you can, you can correct them to say things like, Alex prefers the pronoun she. But if you can also go directly to that person and ask them if they want you to talk to the other person, so you let this person know you're an ally. And never refer to a person as it or he or she, unless the individual requests that you do so. And then, more ways to be proactive. Include your pronouns and your email signature, add them to your class syllabus, and then consider substituting language such as everybody, folks, or this person, instead of saying ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, he or she. So, I guess some people might even want to be called it, according to this. So anyway, like I said, I'm more confused than ever, but this is what's coming down the pike, and so the less that you participate in these kind of things, in my opinion, the less that it's going to happen in this society, but they're moving forward, and if there's a rule in your workplace, if there's a rule at your university, and you have to follow it, or you're not going to be gender diverse, I guess, maybe you have to go to a re-education camp, what does that sound like? I don't know. But anyway, weird things are happening, you don't have to participate in it, at least for now, or unless you're in New York State, which I think they have like 50-some genders or whatever, and if you don't use those, you can go to jail, which I've reported on as well. So, remember, if you haven't read these books, The True Reality of Sexuality, 13 Cubed, you get both of these in an envelope. These are great books to add to your library, written by both Stuart and myself. We have our foundational books, Decoding Your Life, Hyperspace Helper, and Stuart says all of these are really great places to start if you're not familiar with our work. And of course, um, as you know, Stuart will be in Poland and Germany the end of April at our Exposing the Truth conference in Poland and then on to a, another seminar and personal consultations I think are still available in Berlin. In June, I am taking my group again on our Alpine Clear Health and Healing Spiritual Tour. We did it last year. I've been up there several times. It's an amazing, phenomenal journey. So if you need some spiritual healing, physical healing, whatever that you need to clear out your mind, remember, up in the Cotian Alps, they're made of granite, and therefore you are not subjected to mind control. So your mind can clear, and as I tell you too, the air is clear, the food is clear, and the water is incredible. This tour is only open until the end of April. So if you have not signed up by the end of this month, you're not going. So if you're thinking about it, let us know so we can get you on the list. And after that, our next event is our September Spectacular right here in St. Joseph, Michigan. It's beautiful, beautiful that time of the year. And in October, we have our Big Bend and Carlsbad Caverns National Parks. This is going to be a fantastic bus tour, and we are departing October 6th, so we have this information on the site as well. So lots of things going on here. Be sure you like our Facebook pages. Be sure you comment, you subscribe, you share, join our website's membership, because that's where we do the deeper level work, expansions.com, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.